Hello again. Welcome to another show, Gong Ho. Uh, I think you know what that means. It's extremely enthusiastic. It's a Marine Corps phrase from the Second World War. Uh, I'm going to continue now with a series of shows. I call them Law and Disorder and War is a Racket. Uh, the first show was mainly uh, to refresh your recollection and my recollection uh, as why I'm here right now doing this. How did I come here? What was my background, my standing? What did I go through? Uh, but now I'm going to get it specific. You might recall, you probably don't, back in um, 2014, a man by the, William, by the name of William Cuthbert was arrested by two East Hampton Town police officers, January 23rd. Local guy uh, lives with his girlfriend on Hog Creek Road, a builder. Uh, it was uh, a bitter cold day. He drove to Goldberg to get some breakfast, and then he went down to Nat Pete to look at the ocean, and on his way back, he was driving north on Abrams Pad, stopped at a sign, stop sign, and a car coming the other way on the snow and the ice slid across the intersection and hit his vehicle. So an accident occurred, and it wasn't his fault. Police arrived, and uh, within a few minutes of their arrival, actually, Officer Trotter arrived, William Cuthbert was under arrest for disorderly conduct, although they didn't tell him at the time. He uh, retained a lawyer, and the lawyer told him over and over again, you can't go to trial because all the witnesses are going to, or four or five police officers against you, it's, not, you know, it's almost impossible. He fired the lawyer, he hired me, we went to trial. Now, what I'm going to tell you is I know firsthand. I have the documents, I have the testimony, I did the trial. I had someone do the appeal. William Cuthbert, was arrested and he had not done anything wrong. Nothing wrong. He was arrested, according to him, and I believe him, because the officer said he had a bad attitude. At the scene, the officer did something stupid. As William was walking back to his van, the officer tried to, or did drive by him and the officer said it was very close. The officer actually hit him. And, well, and Mr. Cutbright got in his van on Abrams' path and pulled it over to Akabonic, as the officer said. And then he got out of his van after the officer pulled behind him and went over to the officer and they had some words. That was it. They were by themselves on Akabonic. It was bitterly cold. There were no people there but the officer and him. So he got arrested, they say, for cursing at the officer and causing a public nuisance. There was no public. He didn't do anything wrong. You get it? Nothing. He was handcuffed and after he was handcuffed, they roughed him up. I mean, really bad. He had injuries all over him. But the worst thing they did to him is they took him and they put him face down, prone, on the frozen ground, handcuffed to the rear. You heard that before, just recently, about George Floyd being 
put down in a prone position, face on the ground, and he died. Well, you know what happened? While he was face down, handcuffed from the rear, this officer by the name of Barry Johnson got on top of him, got on top of him, got on his back. And he was handcuffed in such a way, not, the, not a common way, in a painful way. He got on top of him and he pushed his handcuffs towards his head. And William's laying on the cold, frozen ice. That night, after he was released, his girlfriend, Janna Nishida, took photographs of all the injuries. Actually, there were photographs taken of the injuries at the precinct, because he said, take these photos. And you know what they called them? Sergeant Claffin took the photos. Now, hold on. Possible in custody injuries. The police took the photos of his injuries, but they didn't come in a trial because they didn't lay the foundation. Nobody came in to introduce them. But that's what, that's what it says. They gave this to me. Possible in custody injuries. Of course they were in custody. He was handcuffed. And he had a lot of injuries. So, when he got out, his girlfriend took this photo of his back. See all that redness? That was caused by Officer Johnson kneeling on his back while he was in a prone position and cuffed to the rear. They kept him out in the cold for about 40 minutes. Still makes me angry. Here, in this town, what did he do? Didn't do anything. He had some words with the officer because the officer hit him as the officer pulled around, hit him with a police vehicle. And he said to the officer, do you realize you hit me? And the officer didn't respond. And he said again, again. And then he said, well, you know, get a field officer here. And the officer said to him, this is what, Vic, this is what William said. And I believe him beyond a reasonable doubt. You got a bad attitude. And he cuffed him to the rear. William was like, you know, a, a big guy. And the officer was, you know, sort of a, a little guy, a small guy. And after he got cuffed, they did, you know, they worked him over. They tortured him. They pushed his hands that were cuffed to the rear in such a way, immediately it was painful. And they pushed his hand towards his head. And he was out there in the cold for like 40 minutes. But before this all happened, he had called his girlfriend, J Jana. Uh, first, he called her to tell her to call the police, not 911, and to report there was an accident and that he was having problem finding his insurance card. Then he called her again and he said, come on down. And she was at work. Uh, Jana Bennett's uh, upholstery shop. And she came down. And when she came down, he was still out there in the cold. And she walked over and she couldn't see him at first. And then one of the officers uh, stood up and came toward her and told her to back off. It was Officer Frank Trotter. And while she was there, she took some photographs. Only two came out. And what, the, you know what they depicted? It showed William sitting on the ground, on the ice, and police officer Johnson holding him down with his knee in his back. Yeah. There he is, actually two photos. The first one, she, he had, it, she had a new camera, a new phone, she didn't. That's Officer Johnson looking at her with a grin on his face. William is on the ground in pain, pleading for help, and he's grinning. The second photo, you could actually see William. You look close enough, you could see him. The officer had his knee in his back, holding him with his, with his left arm, 
He's in the snow and the ice. And they were claiming, and she was saying, why don't you put him in a police car? We're waiting for a car with a cage to come. Well, they waited and waited and waited, and now there were four police cars on the scene, and he was still outside on the ice. And right in front of her, they dragged him into a police car, face down, and hogtied him, and brought him to the precinct. They kept the cuffs on him for three hours. The cuffs caused injuries to his wrists and his hands. They cut off his blood. All right. They offer him pleas. He says, no, I'm not pleading. I'm innocent. I want to go to trial. Lawyer tells him, if you go to trial, you're going to get convicted. I want to go to trial. The original disorderly conduct. So he's arrested, he's arrested for cursing at the officer. That is not a crime. That's called freedom of speech. You want to curse, you curse. That is not a crime in America. The America we think we know. But remember my dad said to me, don't challenge an officer. They get angry really fast when you're challenging their authority. So that's what he was arrested for, cursing at an officer. William said, well, I didn't start cursing until I was handcuffed to the rear and I was in pain. Then I started cursing and pleading. All right, gets arrested for disorderly conduct harassment and resisting arrest. The charges that Frank Trotter drew up were never changed. The DA went with exactly what was charged. William Cuthbert cursed at him. That's what he got arrested for. That is not a crime or an offense in America, cursing at a police officer. Time and time again, I made his prior lawyer and I I'd made motions to dismiss the case because cursing in public to an, at an officer, public, there's no one around. They're at the intersection of Akabonic and Abrams. It's a golf course. And there's no one there except the officer and him. He gets arrested for that. That's what they arrested him for. He goes to trial. There was no criminal offense, no crime. They try him. And over and over again, I move to dismiss, and Judge Tukolsky just doesn't, I don't know. In fact, this is what he says. I have the transcript about, I make a motion to dismiss. If there was no crime, if there was no disorderly conduct, the other crimes have to be dismissed, the harassment and the resisting, because they're based on disorderly conduct. And this is what he says about the disorderly conduct. A judge, the court, on page 11, yelling and cursing in a loud voice where other people were there to hear it. That's the criminal offense. Do you believe that in America? Yelling and cursing in a loud voice where other people were there to hear it. Who the hell was there to hear it? The only time that they had this conversation, it was just the officer and William. That is not a crime. It's not a criminal offense. He goes to trial. Guess what? He gets convicted. And he hasn't done anything wrong. He gets convicted by a jury. Why? Because the jury gives what? The cops the benefit of the doubt? They should never do that. Not supposed to do that. He gets convicted of disorderly conduct, yelling curses at a cop in America. And they acquit him of the harassment. Now, the harassment is the charge where they allege he kicked, he pushed, he shoved, he did all these things. He gets acquitted of all of those things. And the only person that's hurt during this, this whole incident is him. He's got bruises all over his upper body. And that goes into evidence, all the photos. He goes to probation. I go with him because he's been found guilty. They have to do a probation report. He is 
severely traumatized by what has happened to him here in America. Because it turns out he already has post-traumatic stress disorder from being severely abused as an infant and as a teen by his father, who was an alcoholic. And at the end of the interview, the probation officer says to him, William, I believe you are innocent. I believe the police mistreated you. That's what the probation officer said. She said, I'm not going to recommend probation. I'm not going to recommend any jail time. I'm going to recommend a conditional discharge. That means the case is over. And that's what she did. She believed he was innocent and that he had been mistreated by the police, the probation officer. So he went back to court to be sentenced. Now Judge Tukolsky had the probation report. I had it too. Now, when a person loses a trial and the officer's involved, they go to jail. That's the usual thing. Not here. The judge filed her recommendations. And at the time of the sentence, he said to William, do you have anything to say? Before he sentenced him, he said, yes. I didn't take a plea because I was innocent. I went to trial because I was innocent. I'm going to appeal because I'm innocent. And the judge, a little bit of a wisecrack. However, Mr. Cuthbert, a jury of your peers found you guilty. Hmm, how's that? In America, a male, a man got railroaded by the cops, by the DA's office, by the court. So he appeals. And guess what? The appellate court reverses the convictions and dismisses everything on the very issue that prior counsel and I had argued to Judge Tukolsky, there is no criminal offense here. The disorderly conduct is factually insufficient. So everything has to be dismissed. They reversed it on that. In America, but there's one little catch. Uh, they reversed it on, yes, the disorderly conduct charge was insufficient. Factually, there was no criminal offense or crime charge. Everything gets dismissed. But they never got to the substance of the case. They just dismissed it like that. They didn't bother to decide whether or not he was found guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. It's a joke. He was never guilty of anything. He was innocent from the very beginning. <clears throat> so now he goes to federal court. The case is pending in federal court. He's there pro se by himself because I can't get him an attorney that will stay, stick with him so far. He's had one attorney for a limited time. I was forced to retire in 2015 because of service-connected disabilities that, that occurred in Nam. He's there in federal court and they are fighting him. The town hired outside counsel, a big law firm. They're being paid by the hour. He's representing himself pro se. You know what it comes down to? They're saying he didn't have a favorable outcome, so he can't sue. He won. This is what the defense lawyer says, defending the town and the cops. He won on a jurisdictional technicality in the appellate court. A jurisdictional technicality caused him to be taken into custody, tortured, prosecuted, tried, convicted. And they say, well, in the end, the appellate court reversed on a jurisdictional technicality. Like, he's some kind of big time criminal and he got off. He didn't get off. The case is in, in federal court right now. They're trying to get it dismissed. Trying to say he has no case. Can you believe that in America? You can get arrested for doing nothing. You, can, you could be prosecuted. 
for doing nothing. You could be tried for doing nothing. You can be convicted by a jury for doing nothing. That happened here in this town, and it's ongoing right now. And it makes me angry. And I'm a witness in his defense as to what happened, the procedure, what happened to him. If it ever goes to trial, and the law has changed now, just recently. Now, police officers' personal records, the complaints against them, they are discoverable. So if it ever goes to trial, William is entitled to all the records about them, all the complaints about them, like Chavin. You know now that Chavin you know, didn't take the stand. That would have been crazy because what would have come out of 17 complaints against him before he killed Floyd, 17 complaints against him. Up until now, New York State, we could never get that unless we had reason to believe that the officer was involved in some kind of misconduct before the present case. Uh, someone told me a long time ago, when you stop caring, you're over. <laughs> I haven't stopped caring. There are so many things that uh, I've seen, I've been a part of, it's not over. And uh, I'll be talking about other things. Uh, I was in the trenches uh, and I was, you know, I didn't see the forest for the tree. I was fighting against corruption and misconduct my whole career. And one of my uh, mafia friends told me, Joe, the worst kind of criminals are the kind that have a badge and a gun. That's what he told me. And guess what? He was referring to two detectives at the time. And they, and they finally got busted. They were working for the mafia. They were working for his family, the Lucchese crime family. Epolito and Caracappa. Car they finally got busted. They were doing hits for the mafia. How's that? Two detectives. NYPD detectives. That's how corrupt it is, or was. They were convicted by the feds. I think now they're both, no, one of them died. But for years, they were on the payroll Lucchese crime family. How's that? Now, this is only the beginning. Um, I'm going to come back and tell you things. I'm not, this is not nonfiction. This is all, I mean, this is not fiction. This is all nonfiction, things that I've learned. This is something I learned just recently. I just learned this because I'm involved in a case with the feds. The FBI, Department of Justice, federal judges, one of their big time informers, Felix Sater, who was a business partner of Donald Trump. How's that? While he was a federal informer working for the FBI, he was doing business with Donald Trump. This is true. I could prove it. Here's what I found out recently by doing online research. Some years back, we had a congressional hearing and the title of the hearing was, Everything Secret Degenerates. The FBI use of murderers as informers. That's what the congressional hearing was about. I found the report, but I knew that before because I had been involved in cases where they had informers, particularly one of their really big cases, who was a murderer. While he, he was murdering people while he worked for the FBI, doing drug deals while he worked for the FBI. And I was the one that found out about this. And it turns out that that's what they were doing. They're probably still doing it. That's the way the feds make almost all their cases. They flip somebody against somebody else. And sometimes the body that they flipped is worse than the people they're going after, like Felix Sater. That's the Russian connection right there. Partners with Donald Trump for years. Business partner, while he's working for Mueller. 
a special counsel. How's that? Mueller was the head of the FBI. These are the kind of things that I know. And what did they do? They laundered a billion dollars from Russian oligarchs. That's the Russian connection. And Trump, they can't touch him because everything he did, the FBI knew about it. The Department of Justice knew about it because he was doing it with an FBI informant, Felix Seder. Google him. Trump got a get out of jail card. As far as the feds go, they can't touch him. I'll talk more about that. I'm involved in that case. I'm a witness against Seda, against the U.S. attorneys, the corrupt ones, against his lawyers. I'm fighting for the lawyers that are trying to bring out the truth. Fred Oberlander and Richard Lerner, they are being persecuted and prosecuted right now in our America. And you don't even know about it because it's all in secret. I found out about it. I found them. So I'm angry about a lot of things. <clears throat> I'm angry about <clears throat> the systemic corruption in the, the criminal injustice systems, state and federal. I'm angry about what happened in Afghanistan and Iraq. Why? Because the same thing happened to me in Vietnam. You know, I was naive enough to believe my government sent me there because it was the right thing to do. And I found out while I was there that the government lied to us and there was nothing we could do about it. Because if you told the truth over there, you get court martialed. So that's where I'm at. I'm just... Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, or maybe I gained some wisdom along the way. The only way to gain wisdom is to have to earn it. As my dad said, you always did things the hard way. Yes, go in the Marine Corps, go to Vietnam, become a criminal defense lawyer, never back down. That's the hard way. All right, enough.